Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. I'm on the moon to help you all stay curious today. Of course, we're going to talk about the moon here at the American Space Museum, where the birth of the American Space Age happened here in Brevard County and just 10 miles away from me on July 16, 1969. Three American astronauts headed for mankind's greatest adventure to the moon. 53 years ago, and Marty Winkle, my co-producer, was working as a lead electrical engineer on that LM5, the Grumman tail number of the lunar module that became known as Eagle. Marty, how are you today? I'm great. Hard to imagine 53 years ago, huh? I'll bet you remember it like yesterday. And I'm only 50. And he's only 50. Yep. Well, and <laughs> that's why I got all the gray hair. But something that we all baby boomers remember, I was 15 years old, eat up with astronomy and space and astronauts and, and wanting to go to school to be an astronomer. And uh, so part of our Stargazer uh, Stay Curious today is that we want to, to look at the moon and show you exactly the moon that you can figure out on that one. 53 years ago, they were about three quarters of the way to the moon. They started orbiting uh, the uh, evening of July 19th and July 20th, Sunday evening at about 4.30 Eastern Standard Time is when Eagle touched down on Mare Tranquility. So we're going to look at some of the Mari, they call them. The Lunar Seas is what these uh, dark areas were named after um, in Latin because they thought they were they were uh, oceans and lakes up there. Uh, but of course they weren't. They're frozen lava beds that oozed out about the three billion year point, uh, three billion years ago in the four and a half billion year history of our Earth and Moon. So let's kick it off here a little bit with a big old full moon shot there that everybody's familiar with. And right where my ear is, Marty, good job. Right here is Mare Tranquility Base, right there where my finger is on the shores of Mare Tranquility next to the mountains over here. And above my head is a feature that is very easy to see with the naked eye or binoculars. Don't forget your binoculars out there that you use for sports and birding and so forth. They can be a great astronomical tool. But this Mari above me is the Sea of Crisis, Mare Chrism. And when you see Mare Chrism in the early uh, days when the moon uh, goes from noon and then uh, from f uh, new phase and then starts appearing in our evening sky, that's the first feature you're going to notice. And each day the moon progresses. 28 days is the lunar cycle, 29 and a half days actually. And astronomers in their language talk about a seven day old moon. Well, that's first quarter. A 14-day-old moon is full phase, okay? So you're going to see in a minute that the astronauts actually launched on July 16th when the moon was just a thin sliver in the sky. Why would they do that? Why would they want to land close to the Terminator, the line between night and day? Think about that and stay curious as we uh, progress here along. We're also going to show you at the end of the program today a few of the web telescope images and what they look like in backyard times, all right? So here, Apollo 15, up there in the Apennine Mountains, uh, which was my favorite mission because the first lunar module, LM9, was uh, had the lunar module in it. And uh, that was Dave Scott and uh, Jim Irwin. And, but they landed near a lava rill that really looks cool. They po but anyway, it was an easy, smooth landing in the beginning because we were merely wanting to get there and back. And the hundreds and thousands of people that worked since 1962 when President Kennedy says we're going to go to the moon to 1969, I'm so proud that Marty's my friend. He was an important part of that. Everyone was important. But Marty was an electrical engineer. He was involved with the uh, separation of the of the cables between the ascent stage and the descent stage. And we're going to talk more about this later in the week. 
but Marty had an important job and, and carried it out flawlessly on all six moon landings. Tomorrow we're going to have uh, Charlie Mars and Charlie Murphy here, two Charlies that are friends and were engineers from the early days, two old timers talking about the Apollo program and what it meant to them uh, as they're now in their 80s and looking back 53 years ago. And Wednesday, we're going to have three Grumman uh, t uh, uh, engineers here. And I guess Roger's not an engineer, but a designer. We're going to have a designer. I guess he was an engineer, okay. Al was not. <laughs> Roger Vizioli's going to be here. He was an engineer that was on the design. We're going to have Bill Waldron that was the engineer and the lead over uh, construction of the lunar module. And is Al going to make it? Yeah, hopefully. All right. We're going to have Al here, who is a number cruncher on there. And uh, they're, they're friends of Marty. They they meet all the time. Uh, and uh, to to be friends, they meet all the time. And we've had them on our show before, but you're going to enjoy that program. Wednesday, July 20th, the day when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin spent two hours on the moon. So here are the landing sites there. So kind of keep in your mind's eye that on the full moon at the bottom is this beautiful crater with the rays on it, Tycho. All right. They accidentally have that mislabeled uh, as the Sea of Storms. That's not the Sea of Storms. The Sea of Storms is over here. Here's the Sea of Storms. All right. Ocean is Procyllium. All right. The Sea of Fertility, Mare Fecundutatis is how you... The Latin for that. Uh, the uh, above it is the mare uh, above mare tranquility, uh, and then mare serenitatis, the sea of serenity. All right, you got the sea of rains, the sea of clouds. All right, uh, the sea of moisture. Uh, above my head here is a small little sea, the sea of nectar. The uh, the uh, Latin language being applied to the some of the big lunar features that we see from Earth, the seas. Again, to keep reminding you to put in your head, 11 is right there, right across from Mare Chrism, the big oval. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, and there again, the Sea of Tranquility landing right there. And we're going to take you a little bit closer with some close-up views. You can really kind of figure out with a telescope and, and not you don't need a big telescope that department store telescope if used properly will will direct you there but when they launched to go to the moon uh you could barely see the moon in the sky on july 16th 1969 it was just a little sliver like right here there's a sliver of the moon right there photograph i took you just barely see mere chrism uh right right in there okay I guess Mary Chris would be about right there. The first dark feature you see. So when they let when they launched, their landing site was not even visible yet. But when they landed, here's what the moon looked like in the backyard uh, uh, in 1969. And there is Mayor Chrism up here. And Mayor Tranquility is right below it, right here. Okay. This would be the Sea of Nectar there. So why would they land so close to day and night on the moon? Well, when you think about it, they wanted strong shadows. Like about, uh, if, if the sun rises at 7.30 in the morning, it was about 8.30 in the morning, about an hour after sunrise, where you got those strong shadows. During the daytime, when the moon's full, you don't see the detail of the craters and so forth along the Terminator, is what we call the difference between night and day has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? That's a different kind of Terminator. But everything has a Terminator. Even the Earth, the night and day of the Earth, if, when you see it from space, has a demarcation line of the night and day here, uh, light and dark. So they wanted the strong shadows to see as much detail. And like during the daytime, if you go out at noon or 1 o'clock, it's boring outside because there's no shadow detail, and that's why everyone's kind of lethargic. It's, it, 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 uh, it doesn't stimulate our senses to look around at things. And then when the sun starts dropping at 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the evening, 
things start getting a lot more interesting. You all that golf know that. You can gauge your distances a little better in the morning and, and evening when there's more shadows to maybe give you an indication of how far away things are or the terrain, particularly uh, on undulating greens and, and fairways and so forth. So uh, so there's a lot, lot of science that went into launching the uh, Apollo, uh, any any spacecraft to the moon or any planet for that matter, has to be in a certain spot in time and you are aiming to an invisible spot in time that it's going to meet you at. So this is how the moon looked when Buzz and Neil were walking on it. And again, there you see Mayor Chrism, the Sea of Crisis above my head. You'll remember that. And then this enlargement here shows you the shores of the sea of uh, uh, tranquility here. There's the landing site right there where the yellow line is. And then you see three craters, Collins, Armstrong, Aldrin. Those were named later after the astronauts. They were unnamed, but in a telescope, they look like this, okay? And in fact, the, cr the crater Sabin, uh, th there's the, as I move away, there we go. There's the X marks the spot, Marty, right below Collins. Orbited the moon and took photographs. Also, the Surveyor uh, uh, spacecraft landed uh, about where Aldrin is, uh, the crater Aldrin, uh, to, to, to just make sure that it wasn't going to go through 30 feet of dust or be on such a, a, a tenuous surface that the uh, weight of the Surveyor, which is about 500 pounds, would crash through like a peanut brittle surface. So all of this stuff was was uh, very important, as well as the eyeballs of the Apollo 10 crew that orbited the moon. And they saw the Armstrong Collins and Aldrin craters and used them as uh, uh, markings. And I think that's where the name started to get developed. But uh, when uh, John Young uh, and uh, Gene Cernan and Commander uh, uh, the general, Tom Stafford, orbited the moon in April 1969. They were going to test the lunar module separation and all that, and about nine miles above the surface, they separated the two stages. But it was also a big reconnaissance mission to, to fly the exact flight path that Apollo 11 was going to do. Still, they had the anomaly that over this flat terrain are hidden mass cons, mass concentrations of iron and rock and metal that that affected the lunar orbiting spacecraft and actually sped up Buzz and Neil when they were separated from the command module and Mike Collins and it sped them up uh, and this was uh, not detected on Apollo 10, all right, and this little boost of gravity made them miss their mark by almost three miles. And that was some of the drama of landing on the moon, was that Neil Armstrong was unfamiliar with the territory when that lunar module tipped over and they looked out the windows at about a mile above the landing area. They went, uh-oh, everything we're looking at is whizzing by us, Buzz. You know, we're going to, we, we are long. We are way long. But, you know, well, that's where they landed. And here is the close-up view of the descent stage that Marty Winkle walked around uh, and, and had work to do. Uh, uh, he was on top of the lunar module and underneath it doing his job. And this is a photograph from the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's still orbiting the moon. It's been there for almost 15 years, I think. And it has photographed all of the lunar landing sites and the then the, uh, the descent stage there that you see is marked the bright object there, <clears throat> and you can actually see the footprints of where they like shuffled in the snow and underneath that lunar soil called regolith, it's darker underneath. So actually, you see where Neil Armstrong walked across from the lunar lander there, walked across here, and it said that he deposited something from his late daughter in that crater, maybe her bracelet when she had cancer, and and uh, the poor young thing died of that before he went to the moon. And over here is where they put the camera, 
to record those beautiful two hours of video that we watched from 11.30 Eastern Standard Time on Sunday, July 20th till about 2 in the morning uh, the next day. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the uh, and, and that's where they discarded the cover, the lunar, uh, uh, the PSEP is the, uh, 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 the, the station that they set up for the um, uh, laser, uh, lasers to uh, the little three foot square of mirrors where a laser can hit it and bounce back to earth and you tell how far, it's just millimeters of inches, how far away the moon is. So this is what this looks like, true evidence that we were on the moon. Uh, there are a couple other spacecraft, including an Indian spacecraft that is, is gonna take more close up views. Just popped in my head, Marty, that if any of the private companies make it there before uh, NASA, this is a, there's a congressional law that you can't get closer than one mile of the descent stage, supposedly. It is a national uh, uh, preserved site uh, so that, that is a football field or soccer field would be contained in that. And actually, right close to the lunar module, Eagle, here's a, a drawing that I pulled up. Here's the, the most of the activity of, of them was always in, it was over here, okay? This is where they were walking most of the time, the two hours, all right? Buzz stayed over there. Neil walked over this crater to try to take pictures inside of it to see some boulders that had been in it. He actually thought about a moment about walking inside of it and decided that he better not. Uh, after all, this was an engineering feat, not a scientific mission, all right? Their job was to get there, land, and get uh, a bunch of samples as much as they could, and then get off the lunar surface. In fact, they were 22 hours on the lunar surface, two of those hours. Uh, uh, Neil was out there about 15 minutes longer than Buzz. Uh, but that was the whole idea, right, Marty, was to make sure everything worked on this lunar module on the moon. The only spacecraft designed to fly only in the uh, outer space, all right, really without true. gravity. And uh, the only vehicle that we've built uh, uh, that they're standing up, not sitting down. And the only vehicle built to ever be built to launch off of another alien world so this is quite a unique uh hasn't been duplicated no one's built one yet oh they think they built one the starship but that hasn't even flown around the earth yet and when you see the artemis plans with the gateway they're showing and i've seen many talks here on the space coast by uh, nasa representatives they're actually showing the uh, lunar module on steroids that uh, grumman Northrop Grumman and uh, Blue Origin developed. They're not showing the Starship attached up there. So fingers crossed that we get back to the moon in some vehicle. But this lunar module uh, built by the Grumman engineers in Bethpage, uh, Long Island, and then, and then uh, brought down here. And Marty was part of the 1,500 people of Grumman that worked here on the Space Coast, putting parts of it together and then testing everything out. They're testing the spacesuit, all right? These guys are in their own self-contained world that has to keep them alive on another world. And uh, everything went pretty flawless, quite frankly. And though Neil Armstrong gave it about a 50-50 chance of them landing, he thought they would make it back alive. He thought, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that they would make it back alive no matter what. But uh, he only gave it about a 50-50 chance that on this first shot that they would even try to land. So imagine the excitement when uh, they did uh, unbuckle, un un undock from the uh, Columbia and leave Mike Collins in to orbit by himself for 22 hours on July 20th and 21st, 1969. So we, of course, will revisit that later. Uh, with a good program tomorrow with uh, Charlie Mars and Charlie Murphy, two uh, NASA engineers that have been friends and worked together uh, uh, since the Mercury days. And I don't know what we're going to talk about. I'm going to butt out and let those two guys talk about how they feel about uh, life in general. They both went on to do major things in the space shuttle 
uh, world and so forth. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out there to our usual fans watching, Mark Usiak. Thank you, Mark. I might give you a phone call tonight. So hold your hat. Kevin uh, Prurucker, thank you for watching. Christian Hutcherson, thank you for watching. Pat Palmer, another new name there. Of course, we got uh, Dave Stangy is watching, and uh, Ophelia. Hi, Ophelia. She's watching in Normandy, France. Steve Bowman uh, and uh, Etta Kareen Abludaz. And I'm going to stick with that. And thank you for watching. Uh, and uh, Gary Jarrell. And of course, we got Carlton Bailey. Hey, Carlton. Thank you for watching. He's one of our space launch photographers who we frequently share his work on our Facebook page. So, well, that, that's all for Apollo 11, but I wanted to just uh, keep you aware of where to look for. Uh, the moon, by the way, is in the uh, after midnight sky. It's going to be third quarter or last quarter tomorrow. And so when you drive into go check that out, that wonderful interview with Eric on there, we really knocked ourselves out to kind of show you what these objects that are being revealed in super close up now by the Webb telescope, what they look like in your backyard. So I'm going to reprise a couple of those reprise and Marty, there we go. And of course we've got the, 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 the great shot, the deep space image that shows galaxies, every image in here, except for the ones with the crosshairs. Those are stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Everything else you see is a galaxy. All right. Incredible. And Marty, if I held my hand out in the sky, and if I could hold up a grain of sand, that is the part, that is how much sky that the Webb telescope is seen. All right. Just a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction. I'm telling you, not even a marble held up outright. And I tell you, half a degree is your little finger held out because you can cover up the moon all, all day long because it's a half a degree across. I forgot to mention that, that those big in our minds is very small. And if the moon's a half a degree across, that's right, from horizon to 90 degrees directly overhead, you could stack 180 moons in that, and then 180 moons the other way. All right, so this is a very tiny spot of our sky, and everywhere we look, the Hubble started doing these deep sky images. Everywhere we look, we see galaxies. Well, you're not going to see this from your backyard, all right, uh, but you're going to see this from your backyard if you know where to look, and it's going to look like a, a bunch of fuzzy little cotton balls there, and there's actually five little little faint fuzzies there, right there. All right, right there. That is called Stefan's Quintet because a guy named Stefan, Sir Stephen, named it. All right, after he had a name and it had these NGC, New General Catalog names. This is what the Hubble, the, the Webb Telescope revealed to us. Incredible. And the three in a row going diagonal of orange color they are in a gravity dance with each other the other one up there in the upper left that is in the foreground that's not part of these three that just happens to be juxtaposed uh on this web image all right but what they discovered is that top one up here has a black hole in it and there's another image uh the two different kinds of pictures that the web takes is like this and like that, near infrared, and and then uh, 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 regular infrared images, but that one at the top, right up there, that's a black hole that is at the center of most galaxies. A black hole being uh, gravity so intense that everything is sucked into it and life can't escape. Light light cannot escape. And just wanted to show you a technical chart of what the astronomers around the world are doing with the web data. They uh, have spectroscopes on there, and they can tell exactly what everything's made up of and a lot more. And we will have uh, Dr. Perlman on a, eh, I told him we'd have him back in three months or so and give us an update 
of where we are with the web and, and the universe as we're looking back in time, all right? And of course, this gorgeous image is the shores of a gigantic cloud that is creating stars called the Carina Nebula. You can barely see this in Florida. Uh, it's low to the horizon uh, to you all up north, so you really need to be in the southern hemisphere to see this or closer to the equator. But this beautiful image contains the birth of solar systems in here, just like our own sun being developed in there. And if there's solar systems with planets, there could be life there. But what does this look like from a backyard down in Key West? There's what it looks like with a 300 millimeter lens, the most you're familiar with. An easy target to bring out the reds of this nebula where it's a cloud, a cosmic cloud, hundreds and thousands of light years across where stars are being born. And this is how it looked, just a piece of it to the Webb telescope. Oh, what an awesome image. And what a treasure trove of science. want to look that up on our YouTube channel in our Stay Curious Library, uh, specifically the Star Curious Library. Well, this is a star that blew up and has shed some of its outer shell. Uh, you've got rarefied gases that are slamming into each other. Then it'll belch out another layer, maybe the star. And maybe that gas will be going faster and catch up with the other layer. And what you have up close is an incredible intertwining of gases that are tossed off of a dying star. And we call them a planetary nebula because as you see, it looked, whoop, it looked just like a little planet in the sky, a little round, uh, though that we knew it wasn't a planet, uh, the early astronomers that categorized these. It was just easy to, from a diffuse nebula, we'll call them planetary nebulas. They could have called them round nebulas or, gl or global nebulas. But uh, to confuse everybody that it has something to do with the planet, which they don't, if there were planets around this star, they're gone, buddy, because that's what's going to happen to the Earth someday is about 4 billion years, our sun's going to give up the ghost and it's going to puff up uh, a, a nuclear explosion and throw debris out. And then it might have a series of explosions that intertwine to show you this hot rarefied gas in the middle. The, the blue and the outer areas were the early explosions where it's cooled off in there. So there is the Southern Ring Nebula up close there, Marty. So well, we thank everybody for staying star curious. Uh, I was uh, looking at uh, the Tranquility Base there, and I had actually wrote on our Facebook uh, Tranquility Base. Uh, easy to misspell qu uh, Tranquility into Tranquility and that's why we got there, folks, was the quality conscious of NASA and all of its great engineering uh, 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 companies that work for it. The contractors like Grumman that built this lunar module over my shoulder. Marty, how proud are you to look at that on the moon and know that you were inside of that and all around it? He couldn't walk up and down the ladder because the ladder was made for one six gravity and he would crush it. All right. That's what we forget about is everything was so weight conscious so that when this stage lifted off there and popped up. So we're glad that you're with us to stay star curious on stay curious. And uh, like I said, we will have a couple Grumman uh, shows with uh, the Grummies on Wednesday and two NASA engineers, Charlie Mars and Charlie Murphy, tomorrow on Stay Curious. So thank you, everybody, for all that you do. And uh, once again, our museum is closed for three weeks as we're getting prepared to put new carpet down and some other uh, uh, renovations. So uh, we, if you want to plan a trip here, please come. The week of, July, of August 8th is when we'll be open. And so on behalf of our whole museum here and our Stay Curious, Star Curious production, I'm Mark Marquette, and we can't wait to see you in August in our museum to bridge the space between us.